So good afternoon and welcome again to today's webinar, Working Together for Ontario's Wetlands. Uh, as Melina mentioned, I'm Sarah Hasanak and I'm the Wetland Conservation slash General Conservation Intern here at Ontario Nature. Uh, I'll be joined today uh, by two other speakers as well, uh, Dr. Ann Bell, who is my manager and Ontario Nature's amazing Director of Conservation and Education, uh, as well as Jeremy Malloy, who is the Lead of Integrity of Creation and Climate Change with the Providence Centre in Kingston and who is actively involved with many of his local environmental environmental advocacy groups. Uh, so today we will be covering quite a bit of content, uh, starting with the introduction to the value of wetlands, which will be presented by Ann Bell. Then I'll move into a discussion of the threats facing Ontario's wetlands, including some of the implications of the recently proposed Bill 23. Uh, then I'll pass it off to Jeremy for a while to tell his story of community action for wetland conservation uh, within his local community, and we'll wrap everything up with some of the roles that we all can play in protecting wetlands now and into the future. Uh, as Melina mentioned, we'll also have some time for questions, which you can submit through the Q&A function, um, so we'll have time to answer those at the end, um, and you can also always reach out to me at sarahhasanak at ontarionature.org at any time. Uh, my contact information is also available on the Ontario Nature website on the staff page, uh, and it will be provided in the follow-up email, uh, which we'll send out after the webinar. Uh, so I'm going to start everything off here with a land acknowledgement, and um, of course because of the nature of online gatherings, uh, I couldn't possibly address every community from whose territory you all are joining from today. Uh, I see there's already 300 of you, so that would take a very long time. Um, but I do invite you all to take some time to reflect on and remember the original stewards of the land wherever you are. So today, uh, for myself, I'm presenting from what is now known as Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and actually, the photo shown here is one that I took earlier this fall in a park that's about a 10 minute walk from my apartment, which I really love visiting and I'm so grateful to live so close to. Uh, so the city of Guelph does occur within the Between the Lakes Treaty Number no. 3 of 1784, uh, which is the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples have unique, long-standing, and ongoing relationships with this land and with each other, uh, and the Attawandaron people are also part of the local archaeological record. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the role that, that these communities communities, sorry, have played and continue to play in stewarding and protecting these lands since time immemorial, and I recognize the collective responsibility that all inhabitants have to care for these lands going forward. I'll also express my support for the 94 calls to action replaced raised by the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and I want to remind us all to reflect on how we can contribute to truth and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. I also want to start out by sending a big thank you out to the Zeta and Mark Bernstein Family Foundation, who have generously sponsored today's webinar. Uh, we really couldn't do the work that we do uh, without amazing sponsors like these, uh, so thank you uh, very much again. And one more thing that I'll just quickly touch on uh, before we get into the main content for today's session uh, is a reminder that Giving Tuesday 2022 is exactly one week from today uh, on uh, November, sorry, not October uh, 29th. Uh, so this is an event that takes uh, place annually on the Tuesday after Black Friday and Cyber Monday and the American Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and it represents a global movement and an opportunity for people to give back to the causes that mean the most to them and to celebrate generosity and collaboration. Uh, this year, Ontario Nature will be dedicating our Giving Tuesday donations to the Wetlands Campaign with the goal of raising $30,000. Uh, so donations will support our work to conserve and restore wetlands through our nature reserves program, engage in key battles to protect wetlands from development, uh, increase uh, protection for wetland dependent species at risk, campaign to protect 25% of Canada's lands and waters by 2025, uh, increase awareness about wetlands as nature-based climate solutions, and advocate for stronger laws and policies that protect vulnerable wetland habitat. Uh, the donation portal is available on our website and it will be posted in the chat. Uh, it's open now and donations uh, will be generously matched by our friends at Quest Nature Tours and a longtime Ontario Nature member, uh, up to a total of $17,500. Uh, so with that, I will pass the spotlight on to Anne for a moment to tell us all about why wetlands are so wonderful. Um, Anne has such a wealth of knowledge and experience working to protect wetlands, so I really couldn't speak uh, or think of a better person to speak on this. Um, so Anne. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I've managed to open up my video or not, but it oh, looks like I have. Great. 
So thank you very much, Sarah, for your for your kind words. I really like your question. What why are wetlands wonderful? It, it makes me smile because there are just so many uh, answers to that question. You don't have to be a naturalist or a scientist to appreciate the wonders of wetlands from a biodiversity perspective and other perspectives as well. I'm a regular, even daily visitor to a provincially significant wetland in, in High Park, Toronto. I'm mostly there to check out the birds, but I always see other people there with their friends and families pointing out muskrats, turtles, herons, and so on. It's just a wonderful place for urban dwellers to reconnect with nature and catch a glimpse of, of other life and, and share their experiences and excitement with their loved ones. Wetlands provide us with many benefits, critical at any time, but especially now as, as we are faced with the ever accelerating crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. One economic study commissioned by the provincial government a few years back conservatively estimated that the benefits of wetlands were valued at about $51 billion per year in Southern Ontario alone. And that's the things that you see on the slide here, carbon storage, recreation, et cetera, et cetera. Another study recently released out of the University of Waterloo estimated that the water purification benefits alone were worth $4.2 billion per year in Southern Ontario. So, if you can't be moved to, to protect wetlands for one reason, maybe the, maybe the pocketbook at least, these, these, the benefits they provide are incredibly valuable. Next slide, please. We're fortunate to have an abundance of wetlands in Canada and in Ontario. About a quarter of the world's wetlands in, are in Canada and about a quarter of those are in Ontario, this province. And they're incredibly important for biodiversity. They're home to at least 20% of our species at risk. And they provide food and refuge and movement corridors, et cetera, for these species, but also for many, many other plants and animals. Next slide, please. For good reason, wetlands are increasingly recognized as nature-based solutions to climate change. That's because of their exceptional ability to uh, store and sequester carbon and also to help mitigate the adverse impacts of climate change, such as flooding and drought. Wetlands are one of the most efficient ecosystems when it comes to carbon storage. They have a high, higher soil carbon density than forests or grasslands, for example. In the boreal forest, wetlands are believed to account for about 50% of the carbon storage. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about nature-based climate solutions and carbon assessments, we've been working hard at this in Ontario Nature, and I highly rec recommend that you take a look at our recently released Beginner's Guide to Carbon Assessments, which is now available on our website. Next slide, please. So in an era of climate change, it's crucial that we remember what's at stake. The ability of wetlands to mitigate the severity of the adverse climate change impacts, such as flooding, was highlighted in the report of Ontario's Special, Special Advisor on Flooding in 2019. That report cited studies indicating that uh, wetland conservation was a cost-effective way to reduce flood damages and associated costs. Reductions of up to 29% in rural areas and up to 38% in, in urban areas. So it really does make you wonder why it is that we, uh, so many of us have to fight so hard to protect our local wetlands when they are so valuable. Next slide, please. So uh, to illustrate the wonders of wetlands, I'm gonna finish my remarks with an example. The Nabish Wetland Complex in Northwestern Ontario near Dryden. It encompasses more than 1300 hectares of swamp, bog, fen and marsh communities. It's been evaluated as a provincially significant wetland and it provides significant wetland habitat for moose, for waterfowl and for colonial nesting birds like black tern. It also supports at least three species at risk, including the least bittern, which is pictured here, as well as many, many other rare and significant species. Ontario Nature is working with Eagle Lake First Nation and other community members in the area to permanently protect the Nabish wetlands. One member of the Ontario Nature team, Kristen Satala, got to gain some firsthand experience with the Nabish wetlands this past summer. She conducted carbon soil sampling and bird surveys for the third Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. 
One of her favorite moments was seeing a Virginia rail scuttling through the uh, through the cattails. It was a life for her, which means it was the first time she'd seen one and ever seen one, and she felt very lucky. She had the help of Darlene Salter, a local naturalist who knew the birds, knew where they would be, and knew how to find them. So that so she was very happy about that. Our carbon storage assessments of the Knobbish wetlands um, indicate that the wetland complex stores between 200 to 300 tons of carbon per hectare. And so the difference depends on the models that, that you use to calculate. But anyway, this amounts to between 280 to 450,000 tons of carbon stored in just this one wetland complex. And to try to put this in perspective, it's the equivalent of carbon that would be released if one were to drive a car between four to six and a half billion kilometers, or if one were to drive around the earth between uh, 100 to 160,000 times. So this one wetland complex is just incredibly uh, valuable in terms of carbon storage. All right, so now uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I will pass the present presentation back to Sarah, who's going to talk to us about some of the threats to Ontario's uh, amazing wetlands. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, as always, uh, you give a great presentation and you just, the way that you phrase these things and capture the value of wetlands um, is amazing. So thank you so much. Um, so as, as Anne mentioned, yes, despite the immense value of, of wetlands, Ontario's wetlands are still at risk in a, in a number of ways. Um, there we go. So Southern Ontario has already lost over 72% of its original wetlands, and these losses are continuing. Uh, small near urban wetlands, those little pockets of wetlands that are close to where people live, uh, are at an especially high risk, according to a 2022 study by Waverly and colleagues. Uh, and there are a number of compounding threats that are driving wetland loss across the province, uh, including development and land conversion, climate change, invasive species, uh, pollution, and drainage and altered hydrology. Uh, so while each of these threats is extremely important and needs to be addressed in its own way, I'm going to focus on the land conversion and development threats, which are expected to accelerate dramatically if the Ontario government passes its recently proposed Bill 23, or the More Homes Built Faster Act and its associated policy, which I think it's pretty safe to say we're all quite concerned about. Uh, so Bill 23 and its policies was tabled on October 25th, and this omnibus bill proposes sweeping changes to the province's natural heritage and land use planning legislation and policy. Although it's been presented as a solution to the affordable housing crisis, this legislation serves first and foremost the interest of developers, not the general public. If it passes, Bill 23 and its policies would remove and weaken environmental protections across the board and prevent the public from participating in land use planning processes and decision making. For example, there would be extensive changes to the Planning Act and the Conservation Authorities Act that will prevent conservation authorities from participating in development and land use planning decisions affecting wetlands and other natural areas, and it would largely prevent conservation authorities, environmental organizations, and the public from appealing development decisions to the Ontario Land Tribunal. These changes would leave almost all land use planning decision making power to municipalities that often lack the uh, necessary resources and expertise in environmental planning, uh, allowing developers to remove wetlands and other natural areas from the landscape with little to no accountability to the environment or to local communities. These changes would also dramatically change the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System, or OWS, uh, which is the system for designating provincially significant wetlands, or PSWs. Uh, and these changes would make it so that designated PSWs will be at risk of losing their status, and it would be extremely difficult for additional wetlands to be designated as provincially significant in the future. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those changes uh, just on the next slide. Um, the Bill 23 proposal and its policies also opens up the possibility of a provincial policy on natural heritage offsetting. Uh, now offsetting, which again, I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a moment, is an extremely risky practice and it allows the destruction of existing wetlands and other natural areas on the highly questionable premise of recreating or restoring them elsewhere. Uh, overall, if it passes, uh, Bill 23 will have disastrous consequences for wetlands, farmlands and natural areas across the province. 
So circling back to the uh, Ontario Wetland Evaluation System, uh, this overhaul to the uh, the O's, or yeah, again, the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System is uh, perhaps one of the most damaging consequences of the Bill 23 package for wetlands. Uh, so again, O's is the provincial standard for evaluating and designating provincially significant wetlands, or PSWs. Um, and that's really significant because the PSW designation is a huge part of Ontario's wetland protections as development is strictly prohibited in in PSWs at this at this point. Um, the proposed changes to O's are uh, posted on the Environmental Registry of Ontario or the ERO and that posting is now linked in the chat. Um, but I'm going to take a minute now just to discuss some of the most concerning elements of this proposal. So first I would remove the uh, consideration of endangered and threatened species from the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System and that's currently a super important factor in determining provincially provincial significance, sorry, for many evaluated wetlands. Uh, in effect, this, this could result in a bunch of wetlands losing their designation because this is kind of a determining factor for, for a bunch of them. Uh, evaluations would also no longer recognize or consider wetland complexes, which are groupings of wetlands that are nearby or connected to each other, um, such that their functions and benefits really rely on those interactions with the rest of the complex. This change would leave the smaller wetlands that are part of the complexes vulnerable as most would not qualify as PSWs on their own. It's kind of the amalgamation of kind of the patches of wetlands that interact with each other that is so significant. Uh, provincial oversight of the evaluation process will also be eliminated, eliminated uh, leaving no central agency with the needed expertise to coordinate and validate the evaluation processes and share the results of assessments. Instead, each municipality would be left to interpret and validate these evaluations on their own. And many of these municipalities may already be feeling overwhelmed by the changes to the Planning Act and the Conservation Authority Act that leave them as the primary land use planning authorities. And they're kind of on their own in that regard. So if these changes are allowed to occur, we can expect that all existing PSWs will be vulnerable to losing their designation and the high level protections from development that it provides, and that very few PSWs will be des designated and protected in the future. This will cause wetland uh, loss across the province to accelerate and intensify dramatically. Uh, if you do want to learn more about uh, the proposed changes to O's or the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System, uh, you can read our backgrounder, uh, which has been linked in the chat, and please consider commenting on that ERO posting um, by the November 24th deadline, which is this Thursday, and I know that's coming up very fast, uh, but I do encourage anybody who does have the time uh, to please participate in this process and let them know how you feel about these changes. Uh, and of course, you can feel free to use our backgrounder to help guide your comments if you want to, if you're feeling a little lost on where to start, because it can be quite uh, overwhelming. So another potentially disastrous component of Bill 23 uh, and its associated policies is the possibility of creating an Ontario Natural Heritage Offsetting Policy, uh, which is described in a separate ERO posting, uh, which again has been linked in the chat. Um, Offsetting, which I will get more into detail about again in, in just a couple of slides, uh, is an extremely risky practice uh, whereby existing natural areas are sacrificed based on the highly questionable assumption that they can be replaced or restored elsewhere. This has the potential to open the floodgates to the destruction of natural areas across the province, especially in combination with reduced PSW designation and protections and other proposed changes under Bill 23 and its policies. Offsetting itself, however, is not a new concept. Um, Ontario Nature has been investigating wetland and other ecosystem offsetting for several years, um, and we've produced multiple in-depth resources, including our 2017 report called Navigating the Swamp, Lessons on a Wetland Offsetting for Ontario. Uh, we also have a recent blog post and an Earthwatch article in the On Nature magazine uh, reflecting our renewed effort to update our understanding of recent research um, relating to wetland and other offsetting, which we undertook uh, this past spring and summer. Uh, so this experience over many years has positioned us particularly well to help other groups and members of the public engage on this proposal, uh, starting with sharing some of our expertise uh, during this webinar. So what is wetland offsetting exactly? Uh, at its core, it involves a trade-off where conservation actions are taken to compensate for the adverse effects of development. 
Basically, a developer would be permitted to remove a wetland or another natural area uh, from the landscape under the condition that they create, restore, or enhance um, ecosystems of equal or greater area and value. Offsetting is generally uh, premised on the goal of achieving no net loss or ideally a net gain in wetland or other ecosystem area and function. It remains a controversial and extremely risky practice due to the widespread failure observed to date, even under the most rig rigorous policies. Offsetting should only ever be considered as a last resort and final step in what is known as the mitigation sequence, where developers are first required to take all reasonable action to avoid, minimize, and mitigate negative impacts. Only then should offsetting be considered as a strategy to at least partially compensate for any residual unavoidable damages. Now, wetland offsetting policies have been employed by many levels of government across the globe, including sorry, the U.S. federal government and several Ontario conservation authorities. However, there is a long list of shortfalls uh, that are generally found in wetland offsetting policy and practice. Um, and some of those include uh, failure to properly adhere to that mitigation sequence I mentioned, uh, which results in unnecessary loss of natural areas and wetlands, uh, poor or uninformed offset design, and or careless implementation of designs, uh, which decreases the likelihood of achieving the desired outcomes. Uh, there could be a failure to consult with Indigenous communities whose territories will be impacted and who hold significant knowledge of the land. Uh, there could be a lack of defined performance standards by which to measure success or perhaps more likely failure um, of a particular offset pro uh, project or as of the policy as a whole. Uh, there may be a lack of compliance monitoring, oversight, and enforcement by government authorities, leaving it kind of up in the air as to whether all the required elements of an offsetting design uh, and project are being completed properly. Uh, and there may be poor record keeping, which inhibits governing authorities, offset providers, and others from learning and improving from past experiences. Together, these shortfalls uh, create conditions that are unlikely to result in no net loss of wetland area and value uh, where wetland offsetting is applied. Now, because of those shortfalls and the nature of trying to create or restore ecosystems whose complexities we don't and probably never will fully understand, uh, re research has confirmed that wetland offsets generally fail to replace lost wetland values uh, and therefore do not achieve no net loss as they kind of say they intend to do. Uh, so, for example, a 2018 study by Lorenzo Pizzati and colleagues estimated that wetland biodiversity often requires 10 to 1,000 years or more to recover after a disturbance, uh, even when supported by active restoration efforts. Uh, this highlights the risk of incurring extended, quote unquote, temporary losses uh, when wetlands are removed for development under the assumption that restoring another site will promptly provide adequate compensation because clearly uh, it will not. We'll be waiting for many, many years before uh, it starts functioning as that original wetland uh, had been. Uh, furthermore, the investigations of wetland offset performance across North America published from 2018 to 2022 uh, have consistently reported distinct differences in the biodiversity and ecological function of wetland offsets compared to natural wetlands even after several years. Uh, this shows that wetland offsets are not really providing the same features and functions as the natural ecosystems they aim to replace. And of course, there's the ever increasing challenge of locating an appropriate place to put an offset, um, which is especially true for heavily developed areas which are already lacking in natural spaces. All this to say really that wetland offsetting must be approached with the utmost caution if it must be used at all. So I know I just threw a bunch of information out there pretty quickly. Uh, so I'm going to take a moment just to highlight an upcoming primer, which will soon be available on the Ontario Nature website. Uh, we were originally hoping to have it up and available before this webinar, but we did have to prioritize creating um, some resources related to Bill 23, which I'll mention in the next slide because that's also super important. Uh, that's where they took priority. Um, but the primer uh, will cover all the information that I did just discussed, sorry, uh, and more with the goal of equipping communities and planning authorities with the knowledge and tools that they need to engage in offsetting issues and policy proposals. It will consist of a homepage, which has been partially pictured here. 
and four web page, uh, four web pages. Um, the first one will be an introduction to wetland offsetting, what it is, what it looks like, and some of the research. Uh, the second page will be a policy evaluation framework, which provides uh, 10 key criteria to consider when you're looking at an offsetting policy and trying to decide uh, whether it's good enough or not, and whether it's going to really promote successful uh, achievement, achievement of no net loss goals. Um, the third page will provide some policy examples from four conservation authorities in Ontario who have produced offsetting policies where we highlight some of the really great strengths that these these policies have to offer because they're they were trying their best. Um, and then some of the kind of consistent weaknesses that we see across all four and and really all offsetting policies that I've encountered to date. Um, and then in the final page, we'll provide a slew of additional resources uh, related to wetland offsetting produced either by Ontario Nature or other experts in this area. So I'll encourage anyone who's interested in learning more or engaging about offsetting issues uh, to keep an eye out for when this resource does become available. Um, and if you ever need any additional support related to wetland offsetting, you can always reach out to, to me through my email. Um, I'll also note that the comment commenting period for the provincial offsetting proposal in the ERO posting that we've linked to ends on December 30th, and the primer will be available before then. Uh, I'm not entirely sure when it will depend on some other things that we have going on uh, related to, to Bill 23 and, and other projects, uh, but we will have it out before the deadline um, to help anybody who does want to participate in that ERO uh, commenting period. Um, so for those of you who are perhaps still feeling rather upset and potentially overwhelmed about the environmentally damaging consequences of Bill 23, as I often find myself feeling as well, um, Ontario Nature has produced a bunch of key resources uh, to try and help people engage and fight back against this proposal. Uh, Anne Bell especially, along with many other members of our team, have worked together to create an easy to understand back backgrounder, which highlights 11 major concerns that we have with this proposal. Uh, we've also produced a blog post that summarizes that uh, backgrounder and an action alert, which provides an email template to help people reach out to their local representatives, their MPPs, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark, and the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, Graydon Smith. Uh, all of these resources are available on the Ontario Nature website under our campaigns kind of tab at the top. Go to Bill 23. They're available there. Uh, we've also linked to the blog and the action alert in the chat for this webinar, and we'll be circulating these links in the follow-up email along with uh, several other kind of key links that we've uh, talked about already. So Bill 23 can be super disheartening, and I totally understand that, uh, but there are so many opportunities still where we can work together to protect the wetlands and natural areas that we love. Uh, so for that reason, I really wanted to dedicate the remaining time in this webinar um, to focus on ways that people can and are taking action to protect our ecosystems. I didn't want to get uh, too caught up in the doom and gloom, so we're going to we're going to take a positive spin on this and see where where we can really make a difference. Um, so with that, I will pass the spotlight on to our second guest speaker, Jeremy Malloy, to discuss his experience fighting back uh, with his community against a company who had proposed to develop on a provincially significant wetland in Kingston. Uh, so Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Sarah. And, and thanks to Anne and Melina uh, for hosting this webinar on this extremely important topic. And inviting me to join. Um, so I am going to share a little bit about community action uh, to protect wetlands uh, that happened here in Kingston, Ontario. And I'm going to speak as coordinator of River First YGK, which is a local group that uh, was founded to protect and advocate for the long-term health of the Cataraqui River, which is the lifeblood of our community here in, in Kingston, Cataraqui. Uh, so this is where I live. Uh, slide. Uh, this is the inner harbor of the Cataraqui River, uh, where uh, the Cat Kingston is actually situated uniquely where the Great Cataraqui River flows into the St. Lawrence River and, and meets Lake Ontario. So we're kind of a really important watershed community uh, in Ontario and, uh, you know, the watershed being and the water being where it is, is the reason for our community's existence. Specifically, the inner harbor uh, where I live is uh, you know, a vibrant ecological area, home to different species of fish, 
uh, a really um, a vibrant and, and growing community of turtles. Uh, obviously the water is, is very important for a variety of reasons and, and birds. Um, the Inner Harbor is also right uh, beside Bell Park, which is a very important area to our indigenous communities in Kingston uh, as, a, as a space. It is also very nearby uh, the Integrated Care Hub, which is an important service provider for people experiencing substance use and substance use disorder and homelessness. Um, and, and a lot of people live uh, in encampment outside of that, um, of that service provider. So, uh, you know, our, our community's housing crisis, which is being used as the justification to destroy our community's environment, is, is being lived and experienced by people in the area every day. It's also uh, a place of business and commerce. My brother-in-law works at Metalcraft Marine, which is a world-renowned boat builder that's in the Inner Harbor. Uh, so the Inner Harbor obviously is, is many things to many people. Um, and it is also the site of significant legacy contamination as it was traditionally for many generations starting in the 19th century, uh, a place of the industrial waterfront in Kingston. Most notably, there was a tannery there uh, for, for decades. And uh, you know, tannery chemicals are very toxic, were dumped into the water and the soil. And there were also other industrial and railroad uses in the area that has resulted in high levels of, of, of PHs, PCBs, chromium, other types of chemicals uh, that are uh, within, uh, within the wetland, within the region, uh, and within the sediment of the Cataraqui River itself. Slide. Okay, so uh, our group came together uh, when we learned of a proposal by the federal government, specifically Transport Canada and Parks Canada, to remediate the harbor uh, because of this le legacy contamination, uh, which is a proposal that included dredging and removing sediment from the riverbed um, in some of the water lots that are owned by the federal government. Um, and, you know, a lot of people in our community were concerned about uh, what kind of local consultation there was on this plan. Uh, what kind of risks there would be about resuspending the contamination and releasing it uh, into the Cataraqui and St. Lawrence River, about the impact it would have on uh, the wildlife uh, that has uh, successfully recovered in the region, uh, the impact it would have on people who lived there and worked there. So our group came together quickly uh, to respond to concerns in our community about this proposed dredging. And that reflects that there's already quite a few people and groups that were active and working uh, in the Inner Harbor and, and to protect our waterways at that time, uh, including Friends of Kingston Inner Harbor, the Bell Park Project, Wellington X, and um, Turtles Kingston. And, and I think it's important to, to point out here that all of those groups have different ways of looking at the ecosystem and, and the river, different focuses, um, but we all managed to bring our own different approaches to it and, and advocate, uh, you know, together for the ecosystem, people, and wildlife in the region. Uh, now, we're still working on that issue. Uh, this proposal by the federal government has been modified, but it is still ongoing. It's going to be a multi-year process, so we will be active on it. But why I'm here today is because in our work on that project as River for YGK, it cast another uh, related project on the river in a new light, and that would be the Davis Tannery Development Project. Slide. Oh, uh, here's, uh, here's a, a beautiful example of some of the wildlife that's happening uh, in the region, uh, which is, yes, a toxic and contaminated space in some ways, but also ecologically a very vibrant one as well. And in our different ways of looking, we try to hold both of those. Uh, slide. So the Davis Tannery lands are where the former tanneries was sited and was acquired by a private developer from the city uh, for basically no money uh, several years ago. Um, and the site would require significant remediation in order to obtain a record of site condition and put housing there. Um, and also it is sited, it holds a provincially significant wetland and is obviously bordering uh, the river. Uh, so it's a very ecologically sensitive site. Um, and, and an important site. Um, you know, the Cataraqui River has lost a lot of its wetland protection over the last 20 or 30 years. And, uh, you know, this is an important wetland and, and an important space. Now, the developer's proposal 
uh, is, was not ecologically sensitive in the least. Uh, he, he decided that what he wanted to do was basically raise the entire site as much as possible, cut down 1,800 mature trees, including an over 200 year old grandmother oak, uh, truck out and cap the soil, fill in a provincially significant wetland, although only half of the wetland for remediation, and uh, put a boathouse where uh, a major turtle basking area is currently. Slide. This is an enormously expensive project, and uh, to do so, he would be receiving about $70 million roughly in, um, in uh, tax abatements and, and incentives and brownfield development incentives from the city. So it's important to realize here that um, this isn't even a, a development proposal through normal channels. This is a developer asking to do things that fall outside the provincial policy statement, fall outside our city's official plan, impact environmentally protected areas and, and turtles, uh, and of course, most importantly, require filling in a provincially significant wetland uh, to do so, which would have required uh, a, a ministerial zoning order from the province, uh, which the staff, uh, which the developer and staff wanted to do. Uh, and the point of this was not to create affordable housing. Uh, it was to create condos uh, for affluent people uh, to be paid at market rates. Very late in the game, there was uh, a project uh, of 100 units in this massive project. Uh, to, um, to, to, to add a kind of, uh, you know, gloss, a fig leaf of affordable housing, if you will. But even that was just basically uh, something that the city would have had to pay for. Um, and these are, I think, very much the type of, um, the type of housing that we will get uh, from uh, Bill 23. We will get uh, condos for affluent people and or uh, sprawling uh, type of suburban home type developments uh, that will require, as they will in this case, new service hookups which will be expensive and downloaded onto municipalities. So a lot of different groups uh, worked on this issue. It certainly was a, a coalition community effort, including River First. Uh, a really important group was No Clear Cuts, who focus on the, on the loss of trees. River First, of course, our focus was on the river. Uh, so we brought several concerns through planning committee, uh, to other councillors who were not on planning committee, to the media, and, and also most importantly to our members and, and our neighbours. Uh, so we were concerned about the impact of this remediation on water quality. If it was not done correctly, it could, it could release contaminants into the river. We were concerned about flow issues, which were almost completely ignored in the developer's proposal, i.e. if you put a cap over something that is, uh, you know, purportedly contaminated, uh, what is the state of the flow through uh, the river and the wetland in a space that floods every year underneath that cap? And will that continue to, uh, you know, to move contaminants? Uh, it would be irresponsible to proceed without that. Uh, the impact and timing read the federal um, uh, process. These two things are happening together and, and enormously uh, important. For example, if the feds did a remediation of the, uh, of the river sediment, uh, and then it wasn't done correctly on the shoreline, then the sediment uh, and the river remediation would be completely sundered by the fact you would continually have new sources of contamination flowing in. With the wetland, uh, obviously we're concerned uh, about flooding when you fill in a wetland. Uh, we're concerned about losing more of that protection. Uh, we're concerned about the climate and flooding risks generally of placing this much weight on top of a floodplain. Uh, in an area that does experience uh, significant flood risks. And of course, we were also really concerned about the wetland precedent of what it would mean to uh, fill in a wetland because it was quote unquote contaminated uh, and that the best thing to do would be to you know, fill it in and, and uh, what would that mean for communities around the province? Uh, because we all know that the legacy of colonialism and capitalism in Ontario means that there are contaminants and pollutants in wetlands everywhere in Ontario. And uh, we are called to respond to that. And our belief is you have to respond in a much more ecologically sensitive way than merely saying, okay, well, this is a dirty area. What cleaning up means is to raise it and put up condos. So together with our partners, we uh, did a variety of activities, slide. Uh, we advocated. Uh, to, as I said, media, to community members, to politicians. We held events at the river to celebrate our connection to uh, the area and push back against the kind of uh, very stigmatizing uh, notion that the proponents and uh, their staff and ecologists would put forward that this was a, a valueless area, a, a waste area, a toxic area. Uh, we held rallies, we worked through the media, 
There was so much um, outpour from us and other people in the community that there was a third public meeting held, which is uh, you know pretty rare. Um, and uh, you know, it was at that point that we had the opportunity through a connection, I believe, in Nature Canada to start partnering with Ontario Nature, uh, with Anne and Sarah especially, and it was a really valuable partnership for for my community. Um, they brought expertise, uh, particularly around offsetting, which was definitely on the table here. Uh, we were told that the wetland that was being filled in would be offset somewhere, uh, but you know, uh, there's obviously all the wetland offsetting problems that Sarah pointed out, and also the fact that the wetland, uh, they could not guarantee where it would be or you know, if it would even be as part of the Cataraqui River watershed. Doesn't do our river any good if a wetland is created somewhere in, in Niagara or, or North Bay, right? Um, they also were really able to be an effective um, advocate in terms of the letters they wrote to council, the expertise they brought, and the ability they were able to give our community and, and its electeds um, and media a perspective that was provincial um, from their work in, in wetland and, and water conservation areas across the province. So uh, the good news is, uh, as you can see in that headline, uh, we uh, and our partners um, you know, uh, won in our community. Uh, the first vote of planning committee went our way, then that goes to a wider body of council. Council also voted to reject this proposal by the developer. And that's, you know, really, really hard to do, um, especially when you have a proposal that is backed by staff and, and some councillors um, and the mayor, it is very difficult to win at that point. And, uh, you know, it is a testament to the power of those community groups I mentioned and, and our partnership with Ontario Nature that we were able to do it. Uh, next slide. So uh, importantly, um, a lot of the things that I talked about there, uh, a lot of the, the tools that we used, the processes we engaged, the tactics that we went through, um, you know, they would have been completely off the table with Bill 23. Uh, Bill 23 would eliminate a lot of the oversight and a lot of the processes that we engaged as community members to speak up about an ecosystem that we love. Um, and that's why, you know, and that's the point. The point is to blind us, the point is to silence us, the point is to pave over uh, as much of nature as possible so a very small group of people can get rich uh, over the next 10 or 15 years. And the climate future, the ecological future, the biodiversity future of our province is it won't matter. Um, for example, just to name one, if this had been in play, Bill 23, when we were working on this, I am certain that you know it would have just been that the wetland would have been reclassified as not significant, and uh, you know that part of the uh, piece could have just sailed through. So it's really important that we resist this bill and stand up for our ecosystems uh, any way possible. Um, so I would recommend definitely that people give to Ontario Nature and partner and support Ontario Nature. Uh, Fight Bill 23 in your own communities um, and however you can. You've got, uh, for those of you in the Kingston area in Eastern Ontario, we've got a big rally coming up on Sunday, November 27th. And really consider what it is that we can do uh, to defend our ecosystems if Bill 23 passes. Um, it's going to be necessary. No matter what happens with this government, we will always need to be standing up for our rivers and wildlife and wetlands and uh, and lakes and being protecting our ecosystems for the future. So I think that this is a real uh, moment for everybody in Ontario who's concerned to wonder what it would mean to uh, stop playing defense with uh, these attacks that we get from the government and from developers and start thinking, what are some creative forward thinking solutions we can do to expand um, our ability to, to care for nature and to live in harmony with our ecosystems. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for, for taking time today and, and throughout the last several weeks while we put this presentation together. Uh, it really means a lot to us um, that, that you've been able to join, that you brought this to our attention so that we were able to help you because this was a precedent setting, potentially precedent setting uh, situation. And, and I'm really glad that, that we were able to help all of the uh, community groups who have worked so hard uh, to be successful. Um, so on that note, really, what I want to say is that together we can make a difference. And I think that Jeremy's story really highlights that. Um, so I'm just going to move on for a moment to, to talk about some of the other ways as well that Ontario Nature does support wetland conservation, as well as engaging in those local community initiatives, like, uh, like with the situation in Kingston. 
Uh, so we do contribute to on the ground conservation and restoration of wetlands, among many other ecosystem types, uh, through our nature reserves. Uh, in total, Ontario Nature owns 26 different properties, which measure over 3,100 hectares. Uh, and we manage those with support from local uh, stewardship, stewardship groups, um, depending on where, where the uh, particular site is. Across those 26 properties, uh, there are over 600 hectares of diverse marshes, swamps, bogs, and fens, which are the four kind of overarching categories of like wetland types. Uh, and that includes provincially significant wetlands, uh, areas of natural and scientific interest, and habitat for wetland dependent species at risk, like the Blanding's turtle, uh, which was pictured on the previous slide here, these little babies, um, as well as the least bittern, which was shown on the slide that Anne spoke about uh, for the Nabish wetlands, uh, black ash trees, and carnivorous sundew plants, among many other um, really cool species that, that I think we should all really love. Uh, and I just want to note as well, while I'm talking about the nature reserves, that the photo on this slide is of a maple swamp at the Altberg Wetland Nature Reserve, which is one of our properties in the Kawartha Lakes area. Uh, I really love this photo. I think it shows off one of the beautiful landscapes that you can uh, see if you visit our, our reserves. So you can check them out um, there on our website. There's a map. You can see where, where each of the sites are, and maybe you can visit one uh, if there's one close to you. Uh, and as I've said, and as, as Jeremy's kind of story has shown that we do really love to support local initiatives to protect wetlands, um, depending on the specific situation and what our capacity is at the time. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to promote community action using our blogs, the On Nature magazine, and social media channels. Uh, we may also be able to make submissions to local councils like we did in Kingston if we have the staff time. Uh, that's not always the case, but we, we do what we can uh, with the resources that we have available. Um, and of course, we're always happy to direct community groups to any resources that we have or that we know about that we think might be able to support their efforts. Uh, speaking of resources, uh, we do also create our own resources that aim to empower community groups and individuals to engage in wetland protection. Uh, and that includes the new beginner's guide to measuring carbon stocks that Anne mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, which aims to help groups that want to collect data and demonstrate the carbon storage value of protecting their local wetlands and other ecosystems, uh, as well as the wetland and offsetting primer I mentioned will be coming up soon, uh, which will help guide community input on proposed offsetting projects and policies. Uh, we also use our various forms of media like the blogs, social media channels, and webinars like this one uh, to raise awareness about the importance of protecting wetlands from the various threats that they face. Uh, and the hope here is, of course, to inspire uh, as many people as possible to speak up for their local wetlands because we need feet on the ground. We need people uh, working in their local communities. So the more people we can get out there that are inspired, uh, the better. Uh, and lastly, we do engage directly with government leaders uh, and planning authorities to push for better policy protections for wetlands. Um, and this can look like submitting expert comment to policy proposals, uh, collaborating with authorities who invite us to support their policy review and creation processes, and empowering citizen participation, uh, for example, through our action alerts. Uh, now, many of these strategies can be seen in our response to the proposal of Bill 23, as well as numerous other current and past campaigns that we have undertaken over the years um, and span kind of all areas of environmental protection. Now, Ontario Nature is extremely lucky to be able to gather significant resources and expertise to help us protect wetlands and other wild species and spaces across the province. That said, Ontario is a massive place, uh, and it's impossible for anyone or even any group of people to be everywhere all at once. Uh, so if you're passionate about protecting wetlands uh, like we are, then there's all kinds of ways that you can really help this cause. Um, one quick and easy way, uh, if you're in the position to do so, uh, is to donate to causes that support wetland protection, like our Giving Tuesday campaign that I mentioned at the beginning at that, and that Jeremy so kindly mentioned as well during his presentation. Uh, so environmental nonprofits and charities really depend on these donations to do the work that we do, and every little bit counts. So if you're in the position to donate one dollar, to donate ten dollars, a hundred dollars, uh, whatever you can do, it really, it really does make a difference, and we appreciate every, every little bit. Um, that said, we understand that not everybody is in the position to to donate. Uh, so if you or people, there are people as well that want to go a little bit further. Maybe they want to donate and do something else. Um, so there are plenty of other options uh, available. Every single person in this province does have a local representative uh, in provincial parliaments, your, your member of provincial parliament or MPP, uh, as well as many local authorities that make decisions that affect wetlands and other natural areas every day. 
Uh, so just by reaching out to your local uh, and, and provincial government leaders to let them know that you value wetlands and that you want to continue protecting them is a great way to have your values represented in the decisions that they make. Uh, you can also join or start uh, grassroots local initiatives like the River First YGK group that Jeremy's mentioned in Kingston. Uh, this is a fantastic way to get involved, and it's often these groundswell movements that create the most significant changes. Um, I remember specifically from the situation in Kingston that it was the hundreds and hundreds of, of submissions from community members that really got some council members to, to, to consider rejecting this proposal and thought, you know what, our, our community doesn't want this. Why are we moving forward? Uh, so you, you can make a difference in, in that respect as well. You will be listened to. Um, and finally, you can just get outside and show your local wetlands and other natural areas some love and appreciation. Um, I would just add the little caveat of remembering to just stick to the trails and do what you can to minimize your impact because we know that that you wouldn't want to inadvertently maybe have an, a negative effect on the wetlands uh, and other natural areas that you're trying to show some love to. Um, so with that, that's all I have planned for today. I'm going to extend another huge thank you to the Zeta and Mark Berenstein Family Foundation for sponsoring today's webinar and to the major funders of our wetlands campaign, uh, the KM Hunter Charitable Foundation and the McLean Foundation. We wouldn't be able to do uh, what we do without amazing sponsors like these. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'll also extend a massive thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us today as speakers, Anne and Jeremy, as webinar and kind of technical support, Melina, and to everyone who's just come to learn and listen with us. Um, by being here, you're showing your love and support for Ontario's wetlands, and it makes me so happy to see such a huge group of passionate and caring individuals gathering around this cause. Uh, so with that, we're at the end of our presentation, and I see that it's about 2.50, so we've got, I think, about eight minutes uh, left to answer some questions that may have come in uh, while we were all speaking. Uh, thank you all again, and I'll just ask uh, Melina to please help with coordinating the question period. Excellent, for sure. Thank you so much, Sarah and, and Jeremy, for such an excellent presentation. We will try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, so I think we should start with um, um, just reminding everyone about the resource list. There have been a couple of questions about what type of resources are gonna be included in the document that will be shared later. Um, someone asked, would it be possible to get the links to all the ERO pages? Um, and someone else asked if the references for the value of wetlands could be submitted. Okay, sure. yeah, so I can, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the resources. We can, um, we will be submitting or sending around some resources related to the wetland offsetting stuff. So I'll send out the, the blog and the Earthwatch article, uh, as well as that 2017 Navigating the Swamp report, which is a bit longer and a little bit more technical. So maybe the blog and, and Earthwatch article are, are more accessible, but if you want more detail, that report it will also be there. Uh, we will be sending around the two ERO proposal uh, pro posting, sorry, uh, that we linked to in the chat today, as well as a uh, list of the all the ERO postings that was put together and is updated and maintained by the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. Uh, so you'll have a list of all of the ERO postings related to this, as well as the um, proposal to open up the green belts. Um, that's all available on that list, uh, and it is updated uh, with the deadlines as well, so you can have it all organized because it is very confusing balancing all the different days. Uh, and we'll also provide a link to the Bill 23 uh, campaign page on our website, as well as the backgrounder and the action alert, so you can have direct access to those. Um, other than that, there are a bunch of resources related to wetland benefits on our on our website. You can go to our wetlands campaign page, you can go just to our blog or the search engine on our website and search up wetland benefits and there will be tons of blogs and articles that come up. So if you're looking for additional resources, uh, they're certainly there. Awesome, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have another question that says, how will Bill 23 affect citizens' ability to fight developers who appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal? Yeah, that... I have an unfortunate answer to, I suppose, as far as I understand it, and I will defer to, to Anne and Jeremy as far as their understandings go, but from what I know, you won't be able to participate. I think you may be able to make some sort of submission, but as a an individual that is not involved in putting forth that development and is not a planning authority, 
um, you cannot appeal a decision. So if a decision is made and you are not happy about it, you cannot bring it to the OLT yourself. I'm not sure what the status of, of being able to participate if it is brought to OLT, uh, um, what that would look like. Um, so maybe maybe Anne or, or Jeremy has some clarity on that. Um, but yeah, you, would, you wouldn't be able to, to bring it to trial as an individual of the public. Yeah, all I would add to that, Sarah, is that we're losing that right. We now we we are losing that right. We have that right now, and if Bill Twenty Three goes forward, we're we're going to lose it. So it's it's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Anne. Because yeah, we do we do have that right right now, and we should have that right because it, it is our communities that will be affected, and and it's the communities that live near these wetlands that that will bear the brunt of the of the impact, and it's unfortunate that we're kind of being pushed out of that that process. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question um, from Rob, who's asking, how can one, as an individual, ask that a wetland be designated as provincially significant, if possible? Yeah, that is a fantastic question, and I will, I think I'll have to fully defer that one to Anne, because I have not engaged too much with that, that process myself at this point, but maybe Anne knows uh, from her own experience or working with partners, sure, or Jeremy, so if, if you know. I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, if if you want a wetland evaluated, you have to hire or you have to be um, someone who's qualified. So there is an official designation as a, a wetland evaluator that you have to have to have these uh, wetlands evaluated. Now, um, one of the challenges is if you don't own the wetland and somebody else does and they don't want the wetland evaluated, then you can't get on the property, so you can't get it evaluated. But if you happen to own the land, or if it's on crown land, then you can get it evaluated. And once the evaluator, so the rules are changing. The way it is right now, once an evaluator uh, looks at the property and conducts the evaluation, the results go to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the experts there who um, basically okay or not the evaluation. So it, it always goes, up until now, it's always gone through that central process. But with the changes under Bill 23, that's no longer gonna be the case. You're gonna have whoever does the evaluation submitting it, it's not even clear where it's gonna go from there, but it looks like it's gonna to go to the municipality that will then have that information but it won't necessarily go any further than that because there's not going to be any involvement from, from, from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, which means there'll be no central agency overseeing the process, no central agency um, ensuring the quality of the process or putting the results of those processes into a public space where people have access to the information. So it has been up until now that all of that information, once the wetland's been evaluate, evaluated, it goes into what's called LEO, the Land Information Ontario, I think that stands for LIO. Mm -hmm. And then that um, information is available to everybody, but that's not going to be the case anymore. At least there's no process outlined in the changes to the, to the O's for that to happen. So it's a huge concern, the stepping back of the Ministry of Natural Resources from the work that it's always done around, around wetland offsetting is a huge concern. Because what it means is that you're gonna have these evaluations conducted, um, usually paid for by developers, right? So you've got that interesting dynamic happening there and then submitted to municipalities and then who knows what happens to that information. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, thank you for your answer. And so someone else is asking, how are all of these land use planning and natural heritage decisions being shifted to municipalities that are already greatly understaffed? How? Uh, that is a big question. Um, I mean, it, it's it's laid out in, in the proposals that through the changes to the Conservation Authorities Act, just uh, kind of procedurally thinking it, it'll be transferred by, by removing powers from conservation authorities. So right now, uh, conservation authorities, I think that there's like 36 uh, of them in Ontario. Uh, they are responsible for some permitting uh, procedures. So if there is a proposal, a development proposal affecting a wetland, um, 
a stream, water courses, um, anything to do with flooding and erosion potential, um, that goes to the conservation authority and they have a say in, in whether that they permit that, that to happen. Uh, so that that will be removed. And there is also a proposal uh, under Bill 23 that would remove regional authorities, seven of them. Uh, so regional authorities are kind of these upper tier municipalities that kind of they coordinate planning for a, a larger area. So one example that will be losing their their planning decision uh, making powers would be Niagara region. Uh, another one is Simcoe, I think Dufferin. There's a few other ones. I don't remember all of them, but there are seven. Uh, and they currently kind of coordinate and try to make sure that development is happening within the broader region in a way that is the most efficient in terms of space saving and the uh, existing amenities that are there and transit. Um, so those will also be removed. So we won't have regional regional planning authorities. We will not have conservation authorities participating in these decisions. And that kind of leaves the local smaller scale municipalities on their own. And they and they won't even be allowed to to speak with their conservation authorities. Basically, there's there's a a provision in the proposal that would not allow conservation authorities and municipalities to enter into agreements where the conservation authority could play a consulting role in the decisions that these municipalities are making. Um, so, so it's just the munis municipalities on their own. Why the government is doing this is, is not a great reason, but, um, but yeah, I suppose procedurally that is, that's how they're going about it, uh, among other, other ways throughout Bill 23, which would take a long time to, <laughs> to get into all the details. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, so it's already 3.02 for those of you who have to go. We completely understand. We might stay over five minutes or so to try to get through a few more questions. Um, so there's a question here about the conservation of birds. Um, uh, it says, I believe wetlands can also be the home for many migratory birds. Bill 23 would also essentially be harming the conservation of these bird species too, right? regardless of the Migratory Bird Convention Act. Yeah, so I, I would have to refer back to the Migratory Bird Convention Act. I know that there is some habitat protections in there for migratory birds, which maybe Anne or Jeremy knows a little bit more um, about how that would kind of interact with the PSW uh, situation and, and, and those protections. If it was the Migratory Birds Act on its own with no PSW designation and those protections, I imagine these birds would be much more at risk. Um, I don't think that the Migratory Birds Act stands on its own as a way to protect them. Um, and I know in a lot of situations when you're talking about habitat for species that you have to justify that this is a significant habitat that they're not just passing through for 35 seconds. Uh, so that can be really difficult to prove. So so yeah, it, it would put a lot of these migratory birds and other wetland birds and waterfowl at risk um, of, of already adding to our growing list of, of species at risk in Ontario. Um, so yeah, so I'll maybe defer if Anne or, or Jeremy has anything to add to that, but that's the best of my my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, Marilyn is asking, how can municipalities be supported and enlightened enough to defend our wetlands around us? Yeah, so the, the best thing I, that you can do that I know about would be to just reach out to, to your mayor, to your local representatives and let them know uh, why, why wetlands are so valuable. You can use all of the resources that, that Ontario Nature has provided. There are a ton of other resources um, created by other organizations as well, um, including Environmental De Defense uh, and CELA, the Canadian Environmental Law Association. Um, so you can look look for those resources and just kind of pass that information along to, to the people in your municipality. And you can speak up as an individual and try to get these rallies together. Um, Beyond that, I mean, like it's it's to your local kind of representatives to to do what they do with that information, but you can pass it along and certainly express your discontent with these uh, proposals and that you really want to see these wetlands protected so so that they can kind of take that into consideration and hopefully if they get enough people speaking up about it, then then they will take it seriously. Um, I know that there are also a lot of people in local government and provincial government that do really care about these things, but they're limited in that they're only one person in a much larger system of people that that make these decisions. So it's not necessarily that everyone in government doesn't care about this. It's just it's just what the situation is, and and the, the broader system kind of allows 
decisions to go through that not everyone's going to be happy with. I hope that answers it. Great, thank you. Um, maybe we can do two more questions. Um, so Calder is asking, does Ontario Nature have any priority areas for wetland conservation projects in the province? I know that we do identify priority protection areas. I will defer to Anne as to where those actually might be um, because I'm not as, I don't really work with our priority protected areas system. Um, but Anne, I, I believe should know. <laughs> Sure. So um, a couple of ways of looking at this question. We try to support local groups that are trying to protect wetlands. So, I mean, Kingston was one, the Kingston, uh, the Cataraki Marsh was one. We're involved uh, with another um, wetland in the, in the Ancaster area, another wetland in the Bracebridge area. So when local wetlands are under threat, we try to step up where we can to support, um, to support groups. We also have, I don't know if you're familiar with our story map of candidate protected areas from across Ontario. The map was put together with the um, involvement and, and input from many different organizations around the time when, uh, well, just after the time when the provincial gov government announced that it was going to expand protected areas. And many, many of those sites are wetlands. And if so if you check out our story map, which has these candidate protected areas, you'll see a number of um, different wetlands on that site um, that we're trying to protect that are priorities, not just for us, but for others as well. Great, thanks, Anne. Um, and the last question is for Jeremy. I think people were very encouraged by your story. So Trudy is asking, is the Kingston situation being widely publicized? If people see, learn about a real example of what was proposed, what the results of it would have been, the joining in of this effort would have become far greater, I believe. Are protests with concrete examples to be shown or demonstrated being planned? Uh, oh, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I would suggest, first of all, our struggle is not over. Um, no Clear Cuts Kingston is uh, appearing. Uh, as an as a applicant at the Ontario Land Tribunal, um, which uh, you know speaks to the issues that we uh, were talking about earlier, uh, and if you go to the Small Change Fund um, website, you can support No Clear Cuts uh, in that because it's very expensive to appear at the OLT. Uh, you know the 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 developer has um, has of course appealed the decision, and, and we're going to continue to fight it. We have had really good media locally on this. Um, across the province. I mean, I'm really grateful that we get this opportunity here to share with people from all over Ontario. Uh, there's a really good article in Broadview Magazine called Wetlands versus Developers uh, that I would recommend reading and sharing with people, uh, although it was written uh, before council rejected uh, uh, this uh, proposal twice. Um, but yeah, I think we need to be talking about this. People need to talk to each other uh, about what these areas mean in our lives like people did off the top here um you know one of the things that that gives me encouragement in in a fight against uh you know a a current government that is absolutely committed to destroying environmental protection and planning in order to enrich people is that you know people love wild spaces and they love wildlife and not uh, uh, most people do not want the entire province to be a strip mall uh so, um, you know, I, you go to a conservation area in, in our community any weekend, there's tons of people there. There's people there with their kids. There's people there with their, their you know, aunt and uncle, with their grandmothers, uh, and, and they're enjoying the space and they're enjoying being there in nature and all the benefits it brings. And I would encourage just to uh, have these conversations about how beautiful Ontario is and, and how much there is to protect and, uh, and start talking to each other about what we stand to lose and, and what we can gain if we work together. Because it's not just um, you know important to me morally. Uh, the fight to uh, protect that river and that wetland has bound me to my community and that natural area much more tightly, and that's been enormously valuable for me as a person. So there are, it's hard because the threats uh, to the wetland uh, affect me more now. I get more upset, um, but I also um, am happier um, because of it. So uh, you know, please do tell. Our story and any story you can, you know, the story about Duffins Grove, the story about other communities that are continuing to fight because we're going to need them. Great. Thank you so I much. Just, 
Yes, sorry, sorry, Melina. I'll just add to that as well that um, we do have an article kind of highlighting the uh, situation in Kingston coming up in an upcoming issue of the On Nature magazine. So if you are a subscriber to that magazine, an Ontario Nature member, uh, or if you just visit our website, it's available online uh, for everybody to read. Uh, that will be coming out, I believe it's sometime in December. Uh, mm -hmm. So that will be coming too. And that highlights uh, when City Council did vote to reject uh, this proposal, uh, but it doesn't touch on the developer then appealing that decision. Uh, beyond just saying that they did intend to do it, but they hadn't made any official motions at, at the time of writing. Uh, so that will be coming in December as well. Excellent. Okay, well, it's time to wrap up our webinar. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't get to um, the other questions, but we will follow up via email with a recording of the webinar and with resources, uh, like we mentioned. Um, so thank you to all of our presenters for an excellent session. Thank you for all of our attendees for joining today and for your support. Um, please follow us on social media at Ontario Nature, uh, where we'll post more upcoming online events. And thank you again. We hope you have a wonderful day.